This week, we get our teeth into future food, meat-free burgers bursting with flavour, and some rotten food for thought. I love food. Who doesn't? And like everything else in our lives, food has become globalised. We have access to a multitude of cuisines, out of season, a thing of the past. But the true cost of this indulgence is becoming apparent. With a spiralling public health crisis and environmental destruction. I've been to a facility in North London where our discarded food ends up. In this country, household waste makes up for at least 70% of what's thrown away. Currently, only half the UK's food waste is being processed. If it all came to a place like this, it could power 350,000 households. This place receives about 30 lorries a day, full of waste mostly coming from homes. This whole operation is powered by the waste that comes in here. And surprisingly, there's actually only one machine. Now that's because what arrives here is just the food waste in plastic bags. So all that needs to happen is the plastic be separated from the food. But that shows just how important it is that we're doing our bit at home first. After the food is removed from the bags, a kind of soup is created. It even has its own recipe to make it just right for the next bit of the process. These tanks behind me are actually called the digesters and they work like the human digestive system, breaking down food in just the same way. In fact, the temperature inside there is 37 degrees, the same temperature as the human gut. Once the food is broken down, the gas produced is turned into electricity and the rest is sent as manure to the surrounding farms. But there's no denying that aside from the waste, we need to be creating more food to be able to feed the world's growing population. And to be able to do that, we need to find ways of creating sustainable and efficient farming. So Jen Copestate's taken a trip to the Orkney Islands off the coast of Scotland to see how 5G is being used to do just that. 5G networks are starting to pop up in UK cities, but for many rural areas, even getting a basic signal remains a challenge. Including in the Orkney Islands off the north coast of Scotland, with a population of just 22,000 people. In the past, an argument against setting up mobile networks in remote locations was the high cost of building infrastructure relative to low populations. But this could all be about to change. In a revolutionary move, the UK's communications regulator, Ofcom, is opening up part of the airwaves, or spectrum, to anyone who wants to use it, at cost price on a first-come, first-served basis. Mobile operators want to provide service right across the country. Some places they don't use all the spectrum, and some places it might be available for others to use. We're hoping new innovations will come out of it, new industries will develop. Industries will actually, instead of being constrained by bits of wires or not using it, be able to use radio. Experiments to build local networks are already underway. The 5G Rural First trial has brought 5G capabilities to different projects across the Orkney Islands, one of the most remote and underconnected parts of the UK. But while remote, these islands contribute in a significant way to UK exports, like salmon and whiskey. Salmon is one of the UK's biggest food exports, worth more than £700 million a year. Many salmon farms are located offshore in Scottish waters. With up to 25,000 fish in each cage, there's a lot of data that needs to be collected. This box is monitoring the sensors that are in the water, which include temperature sensors, salinity sensors, and oxygen sensors, so it's seeing how much oxygen is going to the fish. The oxygen levels affect when and how much the fish are fed. Automatic feeding systems work off that data on a Wi-Fi network over a 5G connection, with four feeders running at once. You just did that feed off your laptop? Yes, I, I'm, I'm connected to the barge computer via Screen Connect, 
which is a total benefit to us because we can actually be out on site while continuing to feed the fish rather than have a, a man just sitting feeding fish all day. Mm. He can actually be out working with us and giving us a hand. And some processes are still done by hand, like checking for sea lice, but that too could change. We're going to be doing health checks on them, yep. so we're making sure they're nice and clean. Yeah. Wow, he's beautiful. Well. So if you had a 5G connection, you might not need to do this where you take the fish out of the water so Absolutely, much. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We could have HD cameras that yeah. we could uh, monitor the condition. Focus and monitor the condition, yeah. 5G brings uh, a couple of elements that uh, maybe we didn't have in 4G. Of course, it brings higher bandwidth, but also it brings a, a, what we call low latency. Low latency means that the, the time that the, the signal goes back and forth again, it becomes much much, much faster. We can deploy it in areas that we might have not been able before. All this now coming together into a single infrastructure, providing solutions that maybe over 4G was only a dream. While only 22,000 people live in Orkney, a further 200,000 tourists come to visit its whiskey distilleries and famous Neolithic sites every year. Many arrive by cruise ship, including this Disney one, dropping off hundreds of passengers. By selling access to bespoke Wi-Fi networks over 5G, the local community could pay for the mass needed to get network access all year round. So we're standing in the middle of the Ring of Brodgar and actually you can see two of your masts from here. Yeah, so if you look over here, yeah. oh. see these two masts up there? We're running right from that right now. Fantastic, can we see? Yeah. So that's us connected up oh, there, fantastic. pretty full signal. And yeah. number 15 is Keely Lang Hill. Wow. The signal strength is impressive. Other applications like augmented reality tour guides are being tested, which tourists could also buy while visiting. Is it possible to see if you've got a signal or a connection to a network here? Oh no, I've just got emergency calls only. Have 4G or No, 4G or 3G. 3G or... So this is actually a 5G oh, connection. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, would that be something that you would want to use? Yeah, yeah. 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 Especially if you've got children as well. That's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, and for is. important sites like this in the area, yes. The 5G network is also being tested on wind farms. The Orkney Islands produce over 130% of its electricity demands through renewable energy, selling excess back to the national grid. With sustained winds over 100 miles per hour during the winter and farms in remote locations, having sensors delivering data in real time to a central point can help keep the turbines running in dangerous conditions. These turbines are now connected to a smart grid which mixes renewable energy with battery technology. Before, they were connected by copper wire to telephone lines, making them vulnerable to damage from a lightning strike. We're hoping that the 5G system will allow will minimise the amount of outages that the project can have. You can imagine if we're connected by a, a, a simple wire, that can fail and that will stop generation. And we don't want to do that. We want to be able to provide power whenever it's windy and we can send that to Scotland where it can be used. All these projects are still in the pilot stage, but with Ofcom opening up the airwaves, they could soon become reality. In some of those places like Orkney, where actually Spectrum isn't intensively used. We want um, people to be able to use Spectrum as a way of deploying new services, be it in rural areas where people are doing new innovative things, or actually inside factories or implies offices. As we go towards more industrial IoT and new 5G services, we just want people to be able to use it and do it. Ofcom will assess each bid for parts of this shared spectrum to ensure there's no interference with other users. It will start taking bids for these shared use cases towards the end of the year. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that a hack on financial services firm Capital One compromised the personal details of around 106 million people across the US and Canada. Researchers at Google found five flaws in iPhone's iMessage software that could make the device vulnerable to attack. And in nice work if you can get it news, a US teenager won $3 million becoming world champion of video game Fortnite. Facebook has announced a breakthrough in its mind-bending plan to create a device that allows people to type just by thinking. A UCSF study funded by Facebook uses electrodes on the brain. Facebook hopes it will pave the way for a non-invasive wearable device that can process 100 words per minute. If at first you don't succeed, hoverboard man Frankie Zapata is to reattempt crossing the English Channel. His previous efforts saw him fall into the water halfway across while trying to land on a refueling vessel. And the heatwave may have passed, 
but it doesn't make this device any less cool. Sony have developed a wearable air conditioning device that, using a method known as the Peltier effect, will cool you by up to 13 degrees or heat you up by up to eight, all on a single charge. And finally, Israeli developers have created a device to help you find mosquitoes in your room, even in the dark. The wonderfully named Bozigo uses lasers and some fancy optics to identify and then point out, literally, the location of the pesky bug. You'll still have to get your swatter out though, the device doesn't dispatch them for you, yet. To make the whole food industry more sustainable, we're also going to need to broaden our diets. So I've come here to Copenhagen to visit IKEA's research and development lab, Space 10, to see what they have in mind. What we're exploring in our test kitchen is not necessarily going to end up in IKEA restaurants any day soon. Our starting point is really how do we feed 10 billion people in a sustainable manner and without compromising uh, deliciousness. What am I having? Today you're having our Douglas hot dog. A Douglas hot dog? We use carrots instead of uh, sausages. Okay. Which we have uh, poached in, the, in the, a mixture of uh, apple juice and carrot juice. And then we have uh, dried them in the oven for about one and a half hours. So they shrink in and they get like uh, this chewy kind of texture to them. Kind of like meat in a way. A lot of what we have come up with is, is plant-based because we know that turning to a vegan diet is simply uh, the most sustainable thing you can do as an individual. But besides that, we need some protein. And there we have explored everything from insects, uh, not only because they're environmentally friendly, but also because they are delicious. We have explored microalgae or spirulina. The only challenge with spirulina is that it tastes like algae. So we have really tried to find ways of how can we actually make this uh, taste good. And we're gonna start off by putting this puree or paste of uh, pumpkin seeds. We're just gonna put that in the bottom of the hot dog and then we're gonna add the carrot and uh, our beetroot ketchup. So time for a tasting. Mm. You like it? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm -hmm. It doesn't taste like a normal hot dog, no. but it tastes a lot better. I would never be eating a normal really? hot dog. Oh, thank you. The flavour of all the sauces, there's just so many different tastes in yeah. there and they're all quite intense. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a bit messy eating on camera. But beyond the ingredients, IKEA is also hoping to reduce its carbon footprint, introducing hydroponic farming in all stores. This method creates the perfect environment for growing plants using their food waste as fertiliser. But we could all be getting a bit more creative with our waste, it seems. Take leftover ground coffee for a start. Because you only use 1% of the nutrients in the coffee grounds when you make a cup of coffee. We actually use some of our coffee grounds for shortbreads and others for growing oyster mushrooms. Will there be caffeine in them? Will they keep me awake? <laughs> I actually don't know, but I, I, I don't believe so. One issue we hear a lot about is the need for a sustainable alternative to meat. That could mean a plant-based alternative or something created in a lab. But are they really more environmentally friendly? Well, Kate Russell's been finding out. We've grown so accustomed to eating meat every day that global consumption is almost five times higher than just 50 years ago, reaching a staggering 330 million tonnes every year. And that is a problem. Beyond Meat in LA, they've designed the next generation of meat substitute by analysing it at a cellular level. They then went hunting through the plant kingdom for enzymes, fats and proteins that behave in the same way as the elements of the meat. In this case, extracted from peas, potatoes and with beetroot for blood. I know it's not meat and I'm going to taste it soon, but just from the juice, it feels like a burger. The result is a juicy burger patty that even looks like real meat. 
complete with marbled fat and a succulent ooze when you bite into it. As well as the visual appeal, scientists here use an e-nose to examine the components of aroma so they can be mimicked in the lab. The, uh, I'm just going to do it the way you do a burger. Straight on in, try and... Oh, it's oozing all over my fingers. And you know what, Ethan, it's, it's dripping down my hands and oozing in a, in a very burger-like way. So what you're having here is an assembly of amino acids, lipids, trace minerals, vitamins, and water, which is also the composition of animal protein or meat. Yeah. And so what we're doing is essentially bypassing the animal. And our job is essentially recreate meat directly from plants. If you look at the amount of water we use, we use 99% less water. If you look at the amount of energy used, we use about half the energy. If you look at the emissions that we uh, provide, we're about 90% fewer emissions, right? And then lastly, on land, and this is a really important one for the farmer, we use 93% less land. So if you're a farmer and you have 100 acres, you can now grow on seven acres what you used to use all 100 for. There is still one major drawback for your average meat-loving family. Where a pack of fresh beef burgers might be priced around £4.40 per kilogram, the Beyond Meat alternative is currently around £24 for the same weight. If what I'm saying is true, that we're so much more efficient, why are we more expensive? That doesn't make any sense, right? The reason is this is a new industry, it's nascent, we're just building our supply chain out. So as we're able to build our supply chain further and further, we should be able to drop the price of our products below that of animal protein. This burger substitute is 100% vegan, but while vegetable substitutes struggle to recreate the effect of meat, there is one company who have decided to just grow it in a lab. Aleph Farms are creating what's known as cultured meat, which is grown using animal cells. This meat doesn't fill up any agricultural land with gas-emitting livestock and no animals need to be slaughtered. We use less resources, less uh, input to feed the cells than needed to feed the animal, but also addressing the issues of animal welfare, the issues of uh, uh, the use of antibiotics, uh, which is one of the key drivers for developing uh, the superbugs, meaning resistance to antibiotics. The potential for creating a more sustainable way to feed the planet is huge. But again, the price at around £2,000 per kilogram right now puts this way outside regular household food budgets. There is also the not-so-little matter of getting approval from food safety authorities before you can even think about selling it, which could take years. For many, switching to a meat-free diet is partly about sustainability and partly about better health. But beyond the marketing hype, are these heavily processed foods actually achieving either goal? With cultured meat, you are in many cases uh, trading, uh, trading off uh, reduction of methane for potentially substantial increases in the CO2 emission. I mean, there's a lot of debate and uncertainty around if highly processed food is intrinsically bad for you or not. Actually look at what is done uh, to that food on the way to you and how much energy is added to it in the course of processing and how many pollutants are produced, that's, that's an essential thing. There is still a long way to go to produce an effective meat substitute that is both delicious and affordable. But with a third of Britons already stating they lead a mainly vegetarian life, it's a booming market attracting a lot of investment to design the perfect meat replacement. That was Kate. So we've seen how new ways of farming and even creating food in a lab could solve one problem. But we still need to be wasting less at home. So I've been taking a look at some technology that aims to help. These smart tags and containers are still in pre-production. They're designed to ping you reminders about your leftovers. As for your supermarket shopping, well, you can track that using apps like Kitch or No Waste, which alerts you to food that's about to go off and keep track of how much your wastage is costing you. Snapping a picture of your receipt creates a digital pantry. Kitch did seem somewhat better at deciphering the text than No Waste. 
pitch also suggests recipes for cooking soon to expire food, although you'd need to add more ingredients too. The results made this seem a bit of a novelty to me. We've seen a few smart fridges that let you take a peek inside remotely, but those will set you back thousands. FridgeCam is trying to give the same convenience for a couple of hundred quid. The idea is that it'll snap a picture every time you close your fridge door so you can see what's inside from anywhere. It also uses image recognition to keep an eye on the products. Well, that's the aim anyway. In reality, in this type of fridge at least, the camera view just wasn't wide enough to show more than one or two shelves. And as for those snaps, well, they'll tell you who's been opening the fridge. These apps may encourage us to think about how we treat food a bit more, but changing our lifetime shopping and eating habits might be a harder nut to crack. Well, it's lunchtime and there seems to be some food here. This exhibit at the Barbican's Life Rewired event is a creative look at how the future of sustainable food could play out. Visitors vote on which they prefer. This looks like a brace. It is a brace. You just put it on and we have a sensor right inside of it. So it takes information on your intake of food, the saliva that you have in your mouth, and uh, keeps an eye of overview on the hygiene of your teeth. Then that information can connect to your phone. So we can uh, link this information to your activity tracking and see when you run, how much you run, so that we can optimize the food so that you can get to the best self that you want to be. But is it going to taste good? It's going to taste delicious. So what we have is... It looks like a carrot and tea bag, you say? It is uh, a carrot and tea bag, but you can uh, cook it yourself. These food computers could be used to grow crops anywhere, be it our offices, kitchens or even bathrooms. It's an enclosed habitat for uh, the crop. So what we do is that we uh, set up uh, weather climate inside so for example uh, we have managed to grow a pineapple in nine months so before pineapples were um, grown in two years but here we can set up Costa Rican weather with all the humidity perfect humidity as in Costa Rica so that the pineapple was able to grow faster that's one of our biggest inventions we have a, a, a massive crisis on our hands and so the answer to that is mono meal this is something that we believe everybody should have in their homes um, just like you have water coming from the tap, we believe you should have an, a source of this coming straight into your home. What's it made from? We describe it by the nutrients that it's made from. So it's 42% fiber, 32% carbohydra carbohydrates, 12% uh, protein, 3% fat, and 2% sugar. But this means no more food. This will be three meals a day. That is it. No more enjoying food ever again. Well, the way that we like to put it is the enjoyment you get out of having a fair and equal world is much greater than the enjoyment you might have in your present of eating uh, you know, fried chicken or something like that. I've got to put my vote somewhere, and I'm thinking that we don't need to go this far, hopefully. And maybe there is a sustainable way of going for something like this where we can still enjoy healthy food and hopefully everybody can enjoy healthy food and this could be the future rather than semolina for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Let's see. And that's it for our sustainable food special. You can keep track of the team on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at BBC Click. And of course, we'll be back next week. Thanks for watching.